we're an independent membership alliance. Independent means independent from commercial, short term commercial interests, independent from government. It, in fact, if we represent anything, we're representing the, the will to defeat climate change, or possibly we're representing the future business models of the forest industries that exist today. So uh, it's a little bit challenging place to be because we're also paid for through membership. So we're not a trade body. In fact, we're um, a community benefit society, which is the same structure as the housing associations. Uh, and HMRC have agreed very kindly that we're charitable, uh, which essentially means that they recognize that the growing of trees and the building with timber is a charitable endeavor or can be constructed as a charitable endeavor. And that's because of the benefits to decarbonizing both the natural environment and the built environment benefits everybody, not just forest industries or constructors. Uh, we're governed by a voluntary board, uh, I think one of whom is here, John Healy, um, from across forestry uh, and the built environment. Uh, and our vision that we operate to is for Wales as a soci socially equitable, zero carbon, bit of a mouthful, high value forest nation, kind of, you know, you, you get the picture, lots more building with timber, lots more trees, lots more processing of wood, sawmills in all our communities, uh, producing high value products, basically an advanced timber industry. And our mission is to work with the industry to support them to develop uh, and with the people using the timber in the built environment to make sure they use it well uh, and repeat it and do it again and again, rather than do it once and say, Oof, not doing that again. Because change in the natural environment, shifting from sheep to trees, is just as challenging in the built environment to shift from steel, concrete, plastics, the wonder materials of last century, to timber. And actually, if you do it wrong, it gets a bad rap and people don't want to do it again. So it needs a huge amount of investment, whether you're talking about farmers changing to trees or construct or the built environment changing to timber. It's a huge social endeavor, huge uh, and needs massive uh, government support. Uh, these are our members. Uh, currently about 65. Most of the housing associations in Wales are members. Uh, and they're sort of at various stages of committing to build with timber. Most of the timber frame manufacturers in the Welsh borders are members. Some large contractors, people like Morgan Sindel, in fact, the largest contractor in the world, in, in the UK, sorry. And they, they've they joined because they're saying everything that we build in Wales has to be net zero carbon in operation at the moment. That means generate as much electricity or generate as much power as it consumes in the operation. But they know that in the next few years, it's going to be net zero whole life carbon, which means they're not going to be able to build the steel and concrete in the way that they always have done. So what are they going to do? Uh, and I think the timber industry nearly, really needs to hear that message because it's going to change. It's got to change. And con contractors and clients are going, to, are going to be demanding this timber. So it's a great opportunity should we rise to it. NRW are members, architects are members, um, and I'm sure I've missed a load of categories, but also tiny companies, big companies, they're all part of the picture. Uh, one of the ways in which we organize our membership is through communities of practice. Um, and we have five, I think at the moment, possibly six, uh, with a few new, six or seven with a few new ones developing, uh, because essentially it's individuals that are going to drive the change. Change is a relational thing. Business is a relational thing. Uh, and you can't change it overnight. People have to feel comfortable, comfortable, confident, and have people to talk to and share their issues and the challenges and find solutions. Uh, it's not very sexy. It's quite grueling, but it's absolutely essential. So uh, I don't think, really think there's any other way. Um, and just a quick plug for Woodbuild, which I'll replug at the end. Um, Woodbill's all about developing those relationships. So this is a forestry con conference, mostly foresters. At Woodbuild, what we're trying to do is attract foresters. To so we put on forestry related workshops, also attract architects, also, also attract the social housing community, 
also attract the main contractors who can make huge decisions about what they purchase to build the buildings um, uh, and then put on things that appeal to them, but also then mix them up and create opportunities for them to learn about what other people are doing. So last year we took architects, contractors into the forests to explain trees. I can't do that in Swansea, unfortunately, this year, but we're doing something a little bit different. So um, this is the team. I like this slide now because it's quite big. It's great. So we have uh, Christiana Lelig, my colleague, who is a specialist in regenerative systems change. She's a sociologist. So she always helps us think about how we can draw people in and help people shift to a different place, a different way of doing things. Uh, David, who's from a lifetime in the housing industry. Toby McLean is a structural engineer who spent the first half of his career putting carbon into the atmosphere. And so he tells it and he sold his uh, structural engineering business. And now he's trying to do the right thing and take carbon out of the atmosphere and specializing in timber, working with us. We've got Dinah Stagster, who's in the room here, somewhat of a Welsh national treasure. Uh, unappreciated, he'll never get an MBE, but uh, we appreciate him. Uh, my colleague James Moxie, um, who comes from art schools, universities. Our only PhD, Diana, who um, is a specialist in building performance. John here, who uh, has recently run a group, took a group of small processors. And Anne here up to Scotland to see how the uh, Ashes Association of Scottish Hardwood Sawmillers works and to meet lots of the people who are members of that organisation. Incredibly successful, been going 25 years. Chris Jones, who many of you know, fantastic lifetime in forestry. Sarah, who is our head of comms. Comms communication is massively important. I don't think the forest industries invest anything like they need to in, in public engagement. Uh, it, it's really, we really need to step up. Um, Anna. Anna Dykes, the same name as uh, Dynas, no relation apparently. Um, Kerry in the room here, who also works part-time at the Bar Composite Centre. Rachel Cook, who comes from a contracting background, construction contracting background. She's our head of networks. And two fantastic uh, master's students who are somewhere in the room uh, working, uh, working with us on various aspects of farm forestry development. So uh, that's our system. Um, we're a system change organization, easy to say, really hard to do. There is no silver bullet, as I said before, particularly for system change, but that's the Venn, that's my go-to Venn diagram. So we have to change the way we build, and do that more regeneratively. That's not just, just timber. Um, we can also reuse materials, but we cannot do it the way we have been doing it. So uh, urban mining is a phrase you might come to hear in the future, which is to take the materials out of deconstructed buildings and use those to build new circular economy is another way of putting it. We need to move, then we need to have advanced timber manufacturing at the moment. Most of the advanced timber products that we will need to use to change the built environment are imported. We've got to start making them ourselves and we can do. Uh, it's not right or true that we can't use homegrown timber or fast grown conifers, we absolutely can. Uh, we need a, a forest, a forestry industry that's connected to this system, that's growing timber with the right properties to meet these uh, performance needs that we, that we have. Uh, and and one of the biggest wins that we've got in the short term, uh, which uh, uh, it was published in Nature with a, a paper that we uh, did uh, with a PhD student at Bangor University with John and his team, Ailey Forster is in the short term, the biggest win that we can have is not actually planting trees, it's doing more with the waste wood that comes out of the buildings that we're demolishing. And that is actually starting to happen. There's an economic imperative for that to happen as well. Uh, and uh, Corona Span are investing heavily in um, in waste wood collection um, to turn into a chip for particle board and possibly in the future as a component of their OSB. But we also need to reuse it as beams uh, and and uh, we need to have buildings that can be deconstructed uh, properly. Uh, and that's a big short term win, and we're really not on that in any way that like we should be. But to make all that happen, we need a wood culture. We need a society that understands trees and cutting trees down. And we don't have that. So at that point, I show you this fabulous new book. It's called Sitka Spruce, the Amazing Timber Tree, and it's a children's story. So uh, we've got people employed in the industry at the back. So uh, we've got Bengo there from Mylor um, and numbers of other people that I'm sure many of you will know. 
Uh, we've got 250 of those to give away at, at Wood Build, but if you've got some kids and you want to take one away, I've got about 20 with me. And also this book we'll be giving away at Wood Build, which is literally, well, it's not being published yet, but it will be published in the next two weeks. And it's called Timber, How Wood Can, this is the adult version, Timber, How Wood Can Save the World from Climate Breakdown. So, um, and that's written by Paul Brennan, who uh, is former MEP, and he'll also be at Wood Build to launch the book, another plug. So I absolutely think we can change, we can affect the way people think about trees and timber, uh, and it is in our control to do that, but we need to we need to get on it. Uh, otherwise, none of this can happen. And we'll just stay the way we are. Uh, so really, so what I want to talk to you about in the last hmm, five minutes, six minutes is the Homegrown Homes project. Uh, and it started in 2018. Uh, and it's about creating more climate resilient future for Wales by expanding the use of timber in social housing to accelerate decarbonisation of the natural and built environments. Now, social housing in itself in Wales isn't so big that it can change the system, but it can really show the way to changing the system uh, and pioneer things. And they, social housing organisations do build one out of every three houses in Wales, so they're they're significant a significant lever for change. Uh, phase one ran from 2018 to uh, 2021, um, and we applied the knowledge gained from delivery of high performance, low carbon timber social housing, like that one in the picture, or like the ones that are being built down the road in Rahib now, or just completed, to inspire the development of Wales forest industries and to identify all sorts of policy opportunities and from that project came a whole range of outputs, the learning of the difficulties of timber cladding, shifting from plastic windows to wooden windows. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to change from outward opening plastic windows to inward opening timber windows. Well, you can't do that because of knickknacks on the window sill. So all our windows are outward opening. But on the continent, why would you why would you have outward opening windows when you can't maintain them properly? So um even a little thing like that is a challenge. Wood fibre insulation has shifted from uh, uh, being used a little bit to being something that Welsh Government is now championing for the establishment of a factory in Wales. Created guidance on embodied carbon, guidance on building performance. Uh, we produced a document which showcased how we could standardise social housing to guarantee high performance, low energy, low carbon homes and that is now a government project called delivering net zero with 22 collaborating social housing providers that's an interesting one um i spent two years trying to work out how we can get exactly like the woodland carbon code how we could create payments for storing timber for storing carbon in buildings because buildings like trees don't move around so the process of um of verifying that the carbon is stored in a building is is actually quite doable, but um, the trading of the car we, we we went as far as getting uh, legal easements to separate the stored carbon from the ownership of the person owning the building to the ownership of the person buying the carbon. I don't believe in it anymore. Uh, I'll come back to that if I have time. Uh, and it made me reflect on the Woodland Carbon Code as well as to whether that's fit for purpose or any, in fact, carbon trading scheme is going to be fit for purpose. A no controversial position. We produced a, a policy uh, document, uh, how to build better with timber, an eco economics document, and a document written by Dinus here about how to better understand the conifer trees and appreciate the conifer trees that we grow. Phase two, um, so phase one was so successful that a whole load of policies changed, particularly around construction and housing. Uh, and so phase two was uh, again supported by Welsh Government was about how we then support the implementation of these policies um, to drive sector development and inform Wales's first timber industrial strategy led by Gail and Anne, which is super exciting. Um, I, I thought you'd be talking about that, but not yet. Not quite yet. OK. Yeah, OK, still in listening mode. So there's all sorts of things going on in the project. Um, uh, I'll just tell you about a few of them. So this options to pay for greenhouse gas removals from wood in construction. 
uh, we're writing a paper on that at the moment. So how do if if storing biomass, if building with biomass is a good thing because it stores carbon for long term, then how are we going to incentivize that? Are we going to have, uh, I don't know, some sort of private sector mechanism or are we going to have you know policies, regulations? How are we going to do it? And so we're exploring that at the moment. Uh, I just throw this in there. This is a bit of work that Wood Knowledge Wales did with Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and a company called Elements Energy. And it was a quick review for UK government on, OK, what are all the mechanisms for getting carbon out of the atmosphere? How much do they cost and how technical ready are they and what potential scale could they be? And my role was to look at wood in construction. Um, CEH looked at afforestation. But the first thing you've got to notice is that wood in construction and afforestation are both score nine on their technical readiness level. Basically, they're ready to go. There are no technical reasons why we can't get on with it. Cost per tonne. Uh, afforestation is just about the cheapest. Um, I had a big argument about wood in construction. Why is it uncertain? Wood in construction is basically free because if you're going to build a building, why not make it a timber frame building? Uh, you're not going to pay any more for it. So, um, but anyway, so, uh, so whether you're talking about a natural greenhouse gas removal or an engineered greenhouse gas removal, we've got the best two in the house for the short term gains. Oop. Uh, yeah, I'm not all the way through, but uh, can I have five more minutes? I don't want to skip. I don't want to skip the discussion time, so I, I'd be happy to just skip to my last slide. Five more minutes, right? So, um, challenge with those two: wood in construction and afforestation. They require massive cultural shift from where we are. So, if you're just going to build a direct air capture power plant, which don't exist, by the way, but, um, you know, that's quite easy. You just get a patch of land and you, you build something enough to change anything. Afforestation requires change. Wood in construction requires change. So timber processing, you talked about the argument between um, conifers and hardwoods that, that you know, some small sawmillers would argue with big sawmills, say we don't need the big sawmills, we just need the little guys. And and essentially, they're all absolutely essential as far as I'm concerned. And we're working on large, with the large scale sawmills, people like Pontrilus, to get more of their timber into social housing, graded C16, for example. Medium sized sawmillers that have started to invest in grading that can supply grades that are not viable through the large mills. And then we've got the small sawmills that work in the communities supplying local timber to housing projects. So all three of them have an absolute key role to play. Um, that's another sign, another sign I need to hurry up. Um, uh, increase in the demand. So we're working on demand side stimulation for getting more um, wood into construction, including a simplified embodied carbon tool. Uh, uh, and we are creating tools for uh, timber framers and also sawmillers to be able to easily calculate the carbon emissions from their um, production because it doesn't require experts. It just requires a simple tool that they can use freely on Excel. And we're creating those at the moment. Doing a lot of work on training and skills. Uh, trees on farms is an interesting one. Um, and we've got a couple of the master's students here that are working, us, working with us on various aspects. One looking at life cycle analysis, the relationship between life cycle analysis and ecosystem services. You probably tell me off as saying that completely wrong. And uh, Heather looking at uh, the role, potential role for LIDAR. And we've also just contracted uh, a farming consultancy to explore what if the 10% was tradable so that uh, a farmer with land that's not really suitable for trees could trade with somebody who's got land suitable for trees. And that means that you could have larger areas of forest, which means you'll get loads more ecosystem services, lower cost of management. It makes loads more sense. And so, and we're doing that all in collaboration with Bangor University. And we're supporting Wales First Timber Industrial Strategy. And to finalise, come to Woodbuild. It's great. It's more like a festival. Can't guarantee Joe Strum will be there because he's dead. But uh, he's, he's a hero of mine, actually, Joe Strummer. Um, I could tell you lots of stories about Joe Strummer. But um, so we've got a lot, we've got streams on wood science. We've got three fantastic wood scientists all in the room. So the question about how good is homegrown timber, if you want a solid answer to that, well, you've got Dan Ridley Ellis, Morwenna Spear, 
and Phil O'Leary, Extrada grading expert, all in the room just together to discuss that. So we could hopefully start to put that one to bed that you can't build with homegrown timber. Even when you show people buildings where we're building with homegrown timber, uh, they'll still say it doesn't work. So um, love to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. And just to say a thank you for the plug for the drafting of the timber industrial strategy. We're aiming to come out to consultation in the autumn with a view to publishing by the end of March of next year. So uh, Gary knows this because he's on our working group, so he's just uh, poking the bear there. Um, <laughs> but that, that's work in progress and we're really keen to hear from everybody what we should be including in it. We'll be at the Royal Welsh Show. We've got a, um, our own little tent on the forestry section all week um, and we'll be doing more of these events to engage with stakeholders in the run up to and during the consultation. So um, I'd just like to open for questions to Gary. Are there any online, Arwell? No. Any questions in the room for Gary or any of his colleagues that are here today? Oh, thank you. I was getting quite sad then for a minute. I've had the pleasure of looking at your book on Sitka Spruce, The Life of for Dame to Kids. Are you giving those to schools? Because a lot of them are trying are doing a lot on eco ecological sides of, of living and educating kids from quite a young age. Are any of those going straight into the school education system? That's a very good question. Uh, we would like to send them into all the Welsh schools. What we need to do is get a Welsh translation. Uh, it's also an audio book. Um, we've, so you've got two, you've got Sitka, person of the voice of the tree, and you've also got Mother Earth. And so we need to get actors. So we just need to raise a bit of money. And once we've got that, then the answer is yes, we'd like to definitely, because there's no point in having them sitting in, sitting in my box or just giving them to the parents who work in the forest industries to read to their kids because they're, you know. But um, yeah, that's what we need to do with it. And actually, we need to get into the schools. It's really difficult to actually find time within the curriculums to get the kids young. But you know that's what we need. We absolutely need to find a way to do. So this is it would. And even if you just get one, who said to me? Somebody said to me, even if you get one in a hundred. Oh. Wait for the mic. Oh, sorry. Inset training days you might find them quite useful. The teacher training days as a distribution tool. Teacher training days, right? To 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 get to the teachers when they're having a training day. Right. Okay. Thank you. I wonder how I do that. Do you know? We'll talk afterwards. Questions in the room. So we're now ahead of time. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. So we've now got um, Elaine from Confor and other speakers on the industry yeah. um, participation section. Thanks. So, uh, that one's just a little tough. Yeah, yeah. Up the mood. Is that one? <laughs> okay, I'll start. Brilliant. Well, first of all, I just like to say um, today is a big moment because I just like to point out that this event has been run by Welsh Government and the, the Forestry Department in Welsh Government. And it's probably one of the first times where they've really pushed forward and created an event. And I think this marks how this department has grown and it's really engaging in the sector. And I just like to say thank you, because I think that is a massive push forward for us in the sector. And it creates that kind of that trust and I see that today is the um, the building of good conversations and getting all the different areas of the sector together to talk and I think it's a fantastic opportunity I'd just like to thank Gail for this so thank you so, sorry, I've got to introduce myself. I'm Elaine Harrison. I'm the National Manager for Wales, 
and uh, for COM4. So my objective in my role is to expand and grow the forestry sector in Wales, which I think is the most exciting job that could be going. So today, um, what we're going to be doing is I've got two members coming forward to speak. I've got uh, Ben Go, who works with uh, Mailer Forestry, uh, sorry, Mailer Nursery. So it's the start of the forestry journey. And then I've got Ewan Parry, who is the regional manager for Teal Hill. So he's in the forest management. And what we're going to be exploring is climate change and how that affects their businesses. And then also they're going to be talking about what support they need in their in in the industry within their business on you know what support welsh government can give them and what forest research can give them because this is the perfect opportunity to explore these so first of all we've got ben Okay, do I, do I have a button? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ben Go. I'm the commercial manager at uh, Mailer Forest Nurseries. And thank you very much for inviting us. And thanks, Elaine, for the introduction. Um, when I saw this event was being organised, just to reiterate what Elaine was saying, it was it was a straight yes. We'll we'll go to that when we're invited to speak. It was okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll speak. <laughs> so um, yeah, very pleased for that opportunity because I think that that raising of awareness and that exchange of knowledge is key. As Gary was saying, it, it underpins everything in terms of policy, in terms of stakeholder discussions, you know, land discussions, all those kinds of things start with a, a bit of a reference point, a what is Sitka Spruce uh, kind of book. So fully supportive of that. So uh, I wasn't quite sure how long I'd have or what the format was. So I've, I've, I've just done a couple of slides, uh, but what I'll try to do is talk a little bit from the perspective of, of a tree nursery, a lot of the things that we talk about, the things that affect us, the things that affect the people in the room, the audience at home, have been spoken about today. So I will I'll refer to those, um, but from a tree nursery kind of perspective. So uh, a little bit about Mailer. Um, we're uh, the largest tree nursery in the UK. Uh, we're based in Wrexham, uh, near Wrexham uh, in North Wales. We also have, also have a site up near Inverness. Um, we, we, we grow trees and actually a lot of people will be aware of sort of forestry and they'll, they'll have a mental picture of, you know, forests and timber and sawmills, but they might not have a picture in their, their heads of a, of a tree nursery. Uh, so hence a picture, uh, up on the, on the screen, but really, as Elaine says, we're right at the beginning of the supply chain. Um, we've got a, a slightly, well, we, we, we have a unique position in that, um, supply chain in that a lot of the innovation and a lot of the um, future decisions which will be locked in at the point that you plant a tree have to be understood, researched, um, and, and decisions made around that on the nursery. So what we grow, how we grow it, you know, which species, what provenances we grow, we need to think about all those things several years, in some cases several decades, before, before somebody starts to put a spade in the ground and, and start to plant that tree. So we're we're quite involved in um, in research. Our science and R and D manager Sheila McCartan is there. Sheila, do you want to put your hand up? She doesn't, but she's over there. Um, and so we're uh, we're involved in things like tree breeding. Uh, we work closely with uh, forest research via the Conifer Breeding Co-op, uh, the Future Trees Trust. We're we're involved in uh, in work they do, um, it, and a lot of innovation around how you grow trees, actually around plant handling. Uh, we were quite involved in um, the introduction of a Acetamaprid uh, and, and various other things. We've got a long-term relationship with Bangor University. So I, I'd, I'd say to those people who haven't been to nursery, and actually quite a few people here have been to nursery, if you haven't, open invitation, do come, learn what we're doing uh, around tree production, tree, uh, tree innovation. So the road ahead. And, <laughs> Uh, once I'd done this slide, I realised that um, it does look a bit like a road, but that wasn't why I chose that that title. But what you can see here is our um, indoor growing facility, uh, and what you can see there is one row of twenty-two. Yep, uh, and that was uh, it was commissioned in June twenty-two. It had support from Welsh government under the Timber Industry Recovery Fund, uh, and really what it's doing is 
a traditional tree nursery is quite akin to agriculture. It's field grown crops. But with climate change, and, and I'll sort of allude to this as we go through the, um, the talk, climate change affects how we grow. Dry springs, uh, you know, hot summers, uh, unpredictable frosts, flooding, all those affect outdoor growing. And you see it in veg production, uh, you see it in ornamental production, and now you're starting to see it in tree production. A lot more of our growing is going uh, indoors into controlled environments. And that row there, so looking off into the distance, there's 1.3 million trees um, in that row. We actually had some visitors recently and we, we, we started sort of doing the sums on it. So that's equivalent to about 650 hectares of uh, planting, which coincidentally is about the average woodland creation figure that's happened in Wales over the last three years. As a couple of people commented, that's depending on how you look at it, uh, an impressive or uh, a rather regretful um, statistic. But anyway, there's 22 of those in our indoor growing facility. So that just gives you an idea of the scale that we operate at. So I just wanted to frame a little bit of what I want to talk about. And what I want to talk about is what are the challenges in terms of, you know, woodlands, forests that we think about when we're, we're going about our daily business and what you know, kinds of things can we as a, as a tree nursery do? And I just plucked this out of um, the, the Welsh Government strategy from 2018. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, the, the world's changed a lot since then. Yes, it, it's, it has. Uh, we can all name the things that have happened since 2018. But I suppose the point I wanted to make with this is it's a quantity and it's a quality challenge. So, you know, we, we can talk about 2,000 hectares and where we are in relation to that, but it's not just 2,000 hectares of anything. It's 2,000 hectares of trees which are going to meet strategic priorities. What do we want from the, those woodlands? And that's something which, you know, we've had a bit of discussion and a bit of debate about today. Um, and crucially, that word about productive potential. Yeah, so that, that's important. So how much do we want to do? And actually, we need to make the choices and have a plan about how we deliver exactly what we want. We can we could plant 2,000 hectares or we could have 2,000 hectares of self-regenerating birch. We could probably do that very quickly. Or we can say, well, what do we want? And hence, what do we plant? And actually, there are even decisions beyond that. One of the themes which I'd noticed as we were talking today is it's complicated. There's, there's a lot to consider. So when we talk about public engagement, actually, it's no wonder that it's hard to engage the public Notwithstanding the fact that as a sector, we're not very good at communication, the considerations and the criteria and, you know, the trade-offs are all complicated. So we need to work harder to do that, but we also need to be realistic about what we're going to achieve in that. So we, we need to prioritise those, those messages. So putting my nurseryman's hat on, one thing which we always moan about when we get visitors to the nursery is lead times. And that's because what you get is, um, you know, a, a, a customer, a forest manager will come to you and go, right, I've got this scheme. Um, I'm planting it in, ooh, I want to plant it in December 2024. Have you got 10,000 of those, 50,000 of those, 6,000 of those, and blah, blah, blah. Well, bearing in mind, a tree can take anywhere up to five, six years to grow. The chances are, the answer to that question is, well, yes, on some species. And no, typically on the species that we're looking to diversify to, because those are new species, um, the supply chain, the seed resource for them, the growing experience for them doesn't either doesn't exist or isn't readily available and is not done in, on spec. So we always talk about lead times. But what I wanted to talk about more widely is actually the lead times of forestry as a whole. You know, if you, if you think of timber as your end destination, as your objective, then it's a you know it's a 40 year infrastructure project we want to deliver timber well that doesn't happen by thinking about it a couple of months beforehand and then if you look even further ahead and i, I wanted to pick robert on a point he made about that curve and not being able to influence that if you think about things like tree breeding then you can influence that because you can start to get a lot more timber from the same tree the same area of land but those kinds of um, programs are long-term programs. So uh, people in the room will know a lot more about the Sitka spruce breeding program than I will, but I, I, I sort of compare it to a, a space program. It, you know, the level of expertise 
the duration and investment involved in producing something which is, you know, performs better than an unimproved tree is a very long term commitment. And crucially, it needs long term, you know, long term support. So and then, as I said, I, I'd always moan about how the, the nurseries are, are, are expected to just be able to bring these on um, sort of at short notice. But the, one of the key words which and we've spoken to Welsh, Welsh government about it is deliverability. These things can't happen. They can't happen overnight. They don't happen overnight. And they certainly don't happen without this kind of interaction that, that we're having today. Yeah. Um, everybody's favourite phrase, the right tree in the right place. I would add to that in terms of provenance. So we talk a lot about species. And one of the challenges which we have at the moment is, uh, and, and my head was spinning a little bit during Chris Reynolds' presentation. I was trying to write down all the different species. I thought, I, I can't. If you think of a tree, if you think about those species, and, and we're, we're talking about you know, diversifying away from Sitka spruce, Sitka spruce was selected as being uh, you know, a, a step above other species in terms of its suitability to the British climate. And then as a result of that, it was put into a breeding program, which supercharged it way above anything else. If you say, I want to diversify, diversify away from Sitka spruce, and I want to use another species that hasn't been improved, you're not comparing this and this, you're now comparing this and this. But once you put it in the ground, that is your opportunity to, you know, that is your choice made and you are locked into that productivity or that suitability um, or, you know, that, that chance for that specific tree to adapt to the future climate it's going to see. So whether you're talking about sort of genetic conservation of, of, of a specific species, whether you're talking about improvement, whether you're talking about suitability and adaptability to future climate, provenance does matter beyond just the species choice. You can't just say, OK, well, and I think a lot of people will you know, have experience with lodgepole where wrong provenance choices were made. And actually, it set the whole sector back. And there's a, there's a presumption against that species. So you can actually do a lot of damage beyond that specific tree by selecting or not thinking about provenance in the right way. So I would say, you know, there are opportunities beyond just species. There are opportunities to, to really achieve very uh, or extra um, performance beyond just diversification. OK, uh, but it needs long term support. Uh, skills in the supply chain. I mean, it's it, it, it always comes up and as it's a fast growing sector, there's always the pressure uh, or, or the lack of skills and those take time to, to develop. One thing which I want to talk about specifically is there's a, there's, a, there's a supply chain. So we can do a lot of work. We can spend millions of pounds on, on tree improvement, on getting the genetics right, on producing a really healthy tree, but it has to go through a supply chain, uh, through you know, a forest, it has to go through plant, plant handling, be grown silviculturally, harvested, uh, before you get to timber or whatever outcome you're trying to achieve. And whilst there's been a lot of focus on species selection, and actually there's been a lot of investment in, in tree nurseries, that isn't matched uniformly throughout the supply chain. So there is a real risk that you can achieve some really great steps forward and then it all fails at one point. And, and one, um, one specific area that, that I think about is plant handling. So a lot of the work which was done by forest research around plant handling, looking at dormancy and storage and, and co-extruded bags and things like that, was done in a different, literally a different climate, a different era. You know, handling of trees during, um, during a, a cold winter season is less and less applicable now. And actually that, um, the chart which, I, I can't remember whose presentation it showed, but the, the stripes, the, the work on plant handling was done just before it started turning red. Those conditions that trees are going out into are completely different now. And actually there's a lot of work and expertise which needs building in that area. So there needs to be recognition that all throughout the supply chain, going back to that infrastructure project, those points, those pinch points need to be addressed. And don't get us wrong, we're not going to address them right now, but they need to be on the on the program of work for the things that we need to, to build capability in. Okay. Um, another 
another ask point, I suppose. Um, we talk, uh, well, it hasn't been spoken about so much today, but we as a nursery are very conscious of biosecurity. Uh, we try not to uh, trade in plants or bring, bring plants in because that's a, a big vector for bringing pest and disease in. Um, but one of the things that drives trade is unpredictability. We talk about the supermarket model and you know the short notice that's received. One of the ways that nurseries try to be able to meet customers' requirements is say, well, I'll grow what I think is required and I'll buy in from Holland, Belgium, France, Southern Europe, whatever else I can't grow because Great Britain is a finite resource in, in terms of tree production and it's a perishable product. So you can't store it over multiple years. So the only option to meet those demands, if, if people suddenly go, oh, actually, I want to replace 10% of my productive forestry with another species that hasn't been grown in this country, it's got to come from somewhere else. And, and, and invariably, that's that's probably Southern Europe. So one thing that helps that, and, and this goes back to the call that Robert was making about a, a plan. It, it's a plan around what's coming. What are the phases in that plan? What can we do today? What can't we do today? Um, and that will allow people to plan, plan production, rather than have to react in a way which might be counterproductive. Okay. So um, that was all I wanted to say. I'm sure there's other things um, that, uh, yeah, that are important, but those were just a couple of points. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we've got Yuan. Click over this. Oh, nice. <clears throat> okay. Um, final slots. You'll be glad to see. Um, right. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, I'm Ewan Parry. I'm regional manager for for Till Hill in Wales uh, and the marches. We never forget the marches. The bit up for the M5. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to have a. Elaine asked me to do a quick five ten minutes, no more. Uh, overview of what I see as um, uh, Till Hill or commercial forestry businesses sort of thoughts at the moment. Um, so a little bit, a little bit about Till Hill. Um, we manage uh, over twenty five thousand hectares of uh, of mostly commercial forestry uh, in in Wales or in the region of Wales and the Marches. Uh, we've got twenty seven staff, um, two offices uh, in Bala and Llandovery. Um, we're owned these days at the moment by, um, we're part of the BSW group and owned by Binderholtz. Um, things to, seem to change quite a lot in the commercial world, so uh, who knows next week, might be owned by someone else. But Binderholtz are the third uh, largest timber business in the world uh, and the number one largest timber business in Europe. Um, if you Google them, you'll see that they do lots of CLT construction, sawmilling, uh, and everything else to do with timber. So, um, you know, they're a family owned business and um, and very large and do lots of wonderful and exciting things. Uh, hopefully one day they'll bring their CLT construction to the UK, we shall see, uh, and help um, uh, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and Till Hill itself is the largest, uh, well, the leading UK uh, forestry business, timber harvesting and, and forestry business in the UK with turnover of in excess of 240 million. Um, key business areas for ourselves, um, my main areas is forest management, uh, managing commercial forestry is the mainstream of that. Um, we do a lot of woodland creation, uh, timber harvesting, obviously we've got our own uh, part of the business which, which uh, buys standing timber and sells it and marks it to the sawmills. Um, woodland certification is obviously important these days. Of course, certification for most woodlands who want to sell timber is vitally important. So we've got that part of our business. Obviously, you've seen Ben and what he does as Melo, which another part, and then Carbon Store, which is obviously an emerging market, which uh, um, we've uh, we've invested in into as part of our business over the past few years. Um, right, uh, threats. Um, I thought I'd start with a. Bad bits and good, and try and be a bit more optimistic because I think a lot of lots of what we've spoken about today has been fairly pessimistic, maybe. Um, and I think we, there's lots of optimism. Uh, there's, you know, we've we've got a really good business here in Wales, and um, 
and a, and a very vibrant sector and there's lots to go at. So, uh, but anyway, we've got pest and disease and probably from a, from a forester's perspective, that's probably the biggest threat to our business. Um, and, uh, and something which is causing concern by top for a uh, red band, you've heard about it today, red band needle blight, ash buybacks, obviously a big, big concern across the country and it's changing our landscape uh, and everything else, IPS um, and so on. Um, obviously we're having, you know, there are changes in terms of climate change, growing conditions are changing. I think we're I would like to be slightly optimistic and think that Wales is actually a very good place and there are some positive moves in terms of uh, certain tree species uh, and growing conditions for tree species and we're maybe not as affected as badly as some other areas of the UK. Um, Welsh Government, it's becoming a bit more challenging all the time. Um, I would say it's, um, you know, it, woodland creation is a, is a big area of work for us and, and I think we we do feel that there's there's too many hurdles in our way. Um, I think that's um, a, a big concern of ours as a business, and and those there's more hurdles all the time. So um, yeah, that's that's definitely a, a, a sort of um, threat. Um, we don't promote ourselves. We've never promoted ourselves. We need to start promoting ourselves uh, as a, as an industry. I think we're really poor at doing it. Uh, I think hopefully that you know there is an ambition to to, to do it, um, and 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 everything that forestry and and timber and trees brings to uh, to everyone who lives in this country and, and further afield. Um, you know we we suffer from floods every year, and all we do is sink it into concrete. You know we use concrete to solve our floods, which don't really solve our floods. Um, there's lots of um, projects here in Wales, Pompren and so on, that have proven over, over time that, um, you know, strategic planting of trees in our landscape uh, can have a massive impact on, on, on what happens in terms of overland flow and, uh, and flooding and so on. So I think we just need to wake up to that as a, as a country and start, start investing in planting trees instead of putting concrete to stop, stop the water. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> jobs, Biodiversity, sustainable materials, carbon sequestration, landscape, recreation, health, all these great things that forestry does. If you ask Joe Public, they don't really get it. Uh, and that's that's our failure, I think. Um, you know, I think we need to start doing that. And it's quite interesting you're talking about your book <clears throat> for young school, school children. It all really starts there. Uh, we've just been um, doing a bit of work with um, Telescope, uh, Teledi Telescope, Welsh TV uh, company, who are doing a children's programme, which is going to include timber harvesting and timber and growing of trees and so on. So, you know, <clears throat> we've got to really start at the very bottom and work our way up and and try and influence um, as many people as we can, including the school children, obviously, who are, who are going to be the future. Um, Workforce is a, is, a, is a big concern, you know, going forward, we are in an expanding business and um, and we need people to, to deliver that. Uh, we need skills and we've started some some, some training programmes with some, some clients already, but I think we need to do a lot more in terms of skills development and training across the board and, and provide opportunities for people to sort of deliver what we want to want to achieve. And I think it's probably both the public and private sector need to contribute more into this. Um, you know, I think we've, we've got some examples, but we need more. Um, and obviously, you know, public perception, um, conifers, broad leaves, that's come up again today, that old chestnut. Um, it always says and it always will. You know, I've worked in both sectors, public, private, broad leaves, conifers, hardwood, softwoods. Um, there's a place for everything. and. Um, and I think, um, you know, we need to sort of, we need to have a, 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 a good news story for, for Joe Public. We need to educate people. Um, we also need to show people what, what, what we do. So, um, so they're threats, but they're also opportunities. Um, yeah, so looking forward, timber, you know, the global demand for timber is going to go up. 2050s, you know, it's going to quadruple. So, so that for us as a business is obviously a real positive driver. We know that's coming. Uh, that's not going to change. It might vary a little bit, but it's coming. So, therefore, there's huge op opportunities for uh, for the whole industry. Um, and we import 80% of our timber. 
um, our timber needs and and you know what Gary and, and what Knowledge Wales is doing is is great. So I think you know we need to do more and more of that, and we need to invest more and more into the use of timber and and you know public procurement. I think is a big big part of this. If 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 our public sector buying foreign timber when they don't have to, then you know we can't expect the private sector to do it. So I think this, you know the procurement process is 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 definitely part of that. Um, got to plant more trees because we've got climate change. Uh, we need to uh, soak up a bit more, bit more carbon and uh, and fight fight that battle. Um, but that's an opportunity. So you know, rather than think of it as a, a a problem, and I'll come to that in a second. But you know, it's a huge opportunity for businesses here in Wales and further afield to uh, to take advantage of. You know, we need. You know there is a will to, to plant more trees and, and that's a big opportunity for any business or, or sector involved really um i've spoken about flooding uh strategic tree, tree planting i think is, is is something we need to really really do push because it's something that the public do uh get affected by you know local communities are getting affected by floods so it's it's quite an easy sell, I think, you know, in terms of making it relevant for people uh, of how important trees can be. And and we need to sort of get at it in terms of explaining what uh, Bridget Emmett, you know, she, they did a lot of work with Pomp Bren years and years ago, and they continue to have lots of information which proves all this. So we just need to get it out there in a simple format to people. Um, the value of timber is increasing. Um, although it always fluctuates, it is increasing, and, and that's that's optimism. Um, and, and obviously, people are using woodlands lots more these days than they used to. You know, they're mountain biking, walking, taking their dog for a walk. Obviously, COVID helped that process to some degree and made made people more aware of of the of their environment. So, um, you know, the fact that people are using woodlands in different ways, you know, is 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 an opportunity. Carbon is being traded, whether you like it or not, and um, <clears throat> the marketplace is there. You know, whatever we think about it, um, it, it you know, it's part of part of our business and part of others' businesses at the moment. Um, and Welsh government do tell me they want to plant more trees, um, and and that is an opportunity for our business. So, right, um, sort of a few key messages. And I, I can be a bit controversial if I want to be. Um, you know, we need to, we definitely need to understand the threats uh, to our business. So, you know, pest and disease, we've got to get on this and we need to spend a lot, a lot of money on it uh, because it's a huge threat to our industry. And, and you know, if there was anything I was going to say to, you know, national governments, Welsh governments, give them some money and, and, and make sure that they can do that work and, and fight you know, those diseases, pests and diseases, which are going to threaten our whole industry. Um, we've got to use our own timber and uh, give Gary some more money because he needs to go out there and promote um, promote more use of, of Welsh timber and UK timber. Um, you know, we need to do an awful lot more of this and we, we need more examples of it. But again, as I mentioned, I think procurement is, is, is a big part of that um <clears throat> yeah the next one uh welsh government needs to decide what they want really um i don't think you can have it all uh forestry timber is getting squeezed between farmers and, and food production and conservation at the moment and we're left in this really thin band in the middle which doesn't give us much room for maneuver and we'd like that part of our part of that cake to get bigger um you know, it's 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 really difficult and it's becoming more and more difficult. And what we've seen over the last particularly five years, I would say, is the area that we can plant is becoming smaller every year and it's getting more and more difficult. And it doesn't feel from someone who, you know, is part of a forestry business that Welsh government want to plant trees. It feels like they don't. Uh, it feels like, you know, it's always can't and not can do. Uh, and and that isn't the way I'd like to feel about it, because if I went back five years, I was really optimistic about this and we've sort of lost ground, um, which is unfortunate. And I think it's there are things that we can do. And, and I think we need to consider 
you know, is that can we be, be a bit more bullshit about it? Can we can we sort of you know we're looking at priority habitats? Some of these priority habitats are in really 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 poor condition, and you need to decide whether or not you could plant them or not. We're not assessing the priority habitats; we're just accepting them and saying no, you can't plant it. What we should be doing, in my opinion, is we should assess them and see whether they are viable for planting or not. Uh, and that would be a step forward if we could go beyond the, the point at which we're just mapping areas out. Um, that's maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, <clears throat> and I suppose talking about broadleaves and hardwoods, what are we going to do about grey squirrels? Because we're planting lots and lots of hardwoods, even ourselves, in terms of our planting schemes. Uh, you know, hundreds of hectares of hardwoods, but we we are facing this problem. Of you know gray gray squirrels and um, uh, and deer, but pr particularly gray squirrels. And you know once you get to years 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, they're getting ravaged. And um, you know we're not getting a grip of it, and we're planting more and more of it, and we're just creating more and more of a problem. Uh, and I'm not really sure, you know, that we're you know we're not dealing with it, and and that's something we're we're facing. Uh, and obviously we've spoken about about skills. So, um, yeah, you know, if I, if I was to plea anything to Welsh Government, can we see a bit more land that we can plant? Because it's fundamental to everything that we do. Uh, and we just need to sort of look at, at this in a bit more detail and, and maybe be a bit more optimistic about it. And, 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 you know, the feeling from someone in the industry is that the power is all with those that say no. And it doesn't feel like we're, we're sort of going in the right direction. Yo. Does anybody have any questions um, for either Ben or Yuan? Or does anybody have any issues that they'd also like to raise that or opportunities that they want to take forward with Welsh Government or Forestry Research? Question online. Oh, it's a question online. Do you want to do online first or? In... Yeah, back here. Yeah. You, you didn't mention um, I love yes, large pine weevil and that's a threat to your business. It's very reason for it. And that's a question for Roger Moore. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Roger. Um no, you're right. It is it is a it is obviously a threat and, and more so because obviously we've we've we're having restrictions on chemicals. Um so yeah, currently, as you mentioned, um you know, gazelle treatment is is being phased out. Um, Forrester, which is a chemical we don't want to use, uh, it is being used um, because it's the only alternative at the moment. Um, we've done a lot of work over the years with um, uh, with Swansea University, uh, uh, Till Hill have, and um, uh, with alternative types of protection. But it's been you know it's been unsuccessful, I would say, and obviously Roger's been part of that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's a threat. And um, you know, if, if chemicals will get phased out, which they seem seems to be the way it's going, then then absolutely, it's a real threat. Yeah, uh, we've we've started looking at alternative approaches. Um, you know, planting bigger trees um, because obviously root collar diameter is a key thing. Um, but with that comes other problems. Uh, you know, establishments is is a lot more difficult. Um, Costs are a lot higher, um, but yeah, it's something that we as a business are obviously looking at all the time. Ben, do you want to add something about Hylobius? Well, not not so much about the challenge of Hylobius, but an observation I had when Roger was speaking was when I talk about that skills and awareness of things through the supply chain. Actually, I thought the awareness within sort of forest managers, correct me if I'm wrong, is a very good around Hylobius. And that's in contrast to certain other areas like, I suppose, um, establishment or, or plant handling where the, the experience is, is less good or the level of knowledge is less good. And that's part of the skills part. So Hylobius is a very relevant aspect and the awareness is good. 
we need to have that level of um, awareness throughout, which isn't really answering Roger's question. We need question to breed some trees which can withstand Nilobius spec. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> and others. Okay, um, on the floor, Eve. I've got I've got the microphone, so I'm going to speak. <laughs> you, Anne, you um, in your request to Welsh Government and FR, you uh, sort of said about raising sort of uh, understanding of pests and diseases. Any chance of unpacking that a bit? What more would the, sort of the, you think the sector would like to know about pests and diseases, particularly from a sort of science point of view? Um. Yeah, I'm not sure if I was exactly saying it was specific to pest and disease, but but yeah, any awareness of of the threats and challenges to woodlands per se, I'm sure the public would would have an interest in. You know, anything that threatens that you know what contributes to their environments or where they walk or where they take the dog or, you know, um, you know, I think I think anything these days, you've got to have the public behind you. You've got to get public support. Uh, and with that becomes, you know, lobbying for politicians to give money to those who need the money to sort the problem. So, you know, it, it, that's how you play the game, isn't it? Whatever the topic is, um, if you can get public support for it, then, you know, as we know with the farmers, you know, public support to them, you know, was really important. And, and they played a very sharp game i would say in terms of food security it's not about food security because we don't eat welsh lamb um we only eat five percent but but what they the sh you know the honest um thing about the welsh farmers was you know they're protecting rural businesses that's what they are they're all rural businesses they're exporting lamb to you know the far east which is a you know we've got lamb selling for 200 pounds ahead at the moment you know it's 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 really good businesses and it keeps people in in you know in the countryside and a lot of those would work in forestry as well so um you know we just need to play the game as, as well as the farmers play that one because i thought what they did was was exceptional in terms of you know turning something around if that's what's going to happen um you know they were very clever in the way they did it Don't get messages out. It's very easy to feel quite negative. The forestry sector for the public. They don't want trees felled. They don't want trees planted. Eve, your mic's not on. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Just better. Yeah, yeah. We probably need to get them into soap operas, vendors, <laughs> or is. Coronation Street. Or just get, I just get that vatted. We need to do something. We've got to break it because we're not getting trees planted, and no. when there's felling, people complain. And the other bit of the that's missing i think from this jigsaw is getting advisors onto farms certainly organizations like till hill do it but there used to be a whole group of koi Cymru and they're yeah. not there anymore and we're missing that that was a lot of people who were encouraging farmers who need hand holding so i think it's probably more welsh government than forest research but we're, we're definitely there's some missing links along the way Hello, everyone. I, I don't. Is this on? God, I hope it is. Um, I don't know if I'm on message and I'm, whether I'm addressing the exam question, but I had three comments I wanted to make about how the day has gone. Is that OK? And the first the first is it's been a great day. Um, I think this is a, has been a credit to, to, to the team who's put this together uh, and to the concept for the meeting. And I've, I've really appreciated being here now for the negative bit. Um, we talk about the sector being, you know, the, the sector being good at, at, at talking internally, but not good externally. I don't know that we're always good internally. Um, it has been a quite top down meeting, you know, including forest research. It's been, you know, the, the great and the good and generally the white males, but not entirely handing down their receive, you know, the wisdom to the to the grateful masses. Um, and one of the things I've really appreciated from this meeting is learning about the grassroots activity going on uh, in the sector. You know, people, small, small businesses, small charities working at a small scale 
uh, and do, and doing their work. Uh, and I think possibly for the future, some dialogue with com you know how we how you engage with communities who are already engaging in forestry in, on a small scale or 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 in a more e with a more ecological bent could be of benefit to the sector as a whole. Uh, and that could be something to think of. The second point I wanted to make was um, something that seems to be missing here is, you know, there's actually been very little talk about species mixtures and its role in resilience. And I have to admit, when I think of mixtures, it fills me with dread because I'm a mathematical modeler and pure species stands are nice and easy to model and predict. The last thing you want to have to predict is a mixed species stand or a, or a mixed age forest, but they do have. A, they, you know, I think they're going to have an increasing role, and there's a challenge here, and we need to start thinking about the role of mixtures. I mean, managers hate them as well because it, again, it complicates management. It put, puts costs up. But how to, do we need to look at mixtures and their role in a resilient forest sector going forward? And the third one was about timber utilization, making the best use of the wood. We do know a lot about how to use coniferous wood. If broadleaves are going to have a bigger role, how are we going to make sure that broadleaf timber is utilised with equally good effect? Because it's not always as easy to convert a broadleaf into, for example, structural joists. As, you know, you might be able to do it with engineered wood products, but that strikes me there's an area there to look at as well. So I, I don't know if any of that was interesting or relevant, but those were the insights I've gained from this meeting in terms of what the gaps might be. Apart from that, it's been a brilliant meeting. Thank you. Big question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you both. You can both sit down. Okay, so the next question I've got, which segues perfectly into it, is um, this is a series of events and um, what I'd like to ask the floor is what avenues are people interested in exploring in the next events and what would it look like if, um, like, structurally? Thanks, Elaine. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'd just like to echo Robert's comments about um, the days. It's, you know, there's been a lot of hard work um, by everybody in terms of who stood up on that stage or been on that screen. So personal thanks to everybody for the um, preparation and delivery. It's been great. There is no but for me. Um, in terms of your question, it's only three speakers have mentioned the word skills. Mm -hmm. The last three speakers, actually. Um, and without being unkind, in passing as well. And um, if we're thinking about how can we make forestry um, appear in a very congested, contested um, place for skills out there, then I think if a, a, sit, a session, and we don't need to go into detail about what form that session might take, but themed around training, skills, careers, education, and then link to that, innovation, because we need to be able to have a pitch, picking up on Ewan's point, where we actually promote this sector as a sector that people really want to come into because it's actually high tech, it's going to need skills, perhaps some of which haven't yet been invented because we need to actually think about sort of technology. We had a bit of a flavor of that in Ben's presentation. But that's the sort of thing that's going to excite potentially new entrants into this sector. And we need to think about how we engage those and, and thinking about timing the event so that we can actually bring along uh, people from Bangor University and from the further education colleges um, and hear from them as well and hear some younger voices and some diverse voices. And, the, and also the third sector. We haven't heard from the third sector, I don't think, apart from Gary uh, today. We've got um, an online question from Becky uh, Wil Wilkinson, RFS. Um, thanks. It was just to sort of respond to that point. So um, I work, I'm the learning and outreach manager for the RFS. Um, and we 
deal with huge numbers of public inquiries from um, people wanting to get into forestry. Um, and our experience is actually that the majority of people seem to want to come to forestry um, in their kind of early to mid 20s. But the problem is by then they they can't access free courses. Um, they've already done their degree. They haven't got the money to do another one and they need to earn while they work. Um, and in that, I've got a Till Hill logo on my screen. I'll say big shout out to Till Hill. Thank you, because the number of people go try Till Hill. They'll take you if you haven't got a forestry degree. <laughs> um, but I think Till Hill do a lot of the heavy lifting on that one. And obviously you've got the scope to do it. But our perspective as the RFS, it would know it's OK, my perspective, but my perspective from within the RFS is that they're often there aren't the opportunities for people to train um if they've already got qualifications because it's just too expensive but also that um there needs to be more entry-level jobs because we see huge numbers of um supervisor jobs head foresters but without more entry-level jobs so there are people wanting to get in hundreds and hundreds of people wanting to get into the sector but it, it's just making it a little bit easier for them to do so, which is kind of a separate conversation to the purpose of this meeting and one I'm always happy to have with people. Um, but in some ways, publicity for the sector isn't the problem here. It's working out better ways to get them in once they've got to early 20s and realised that the thing they trained in wasn't the thing they're actually interested in. Brilliant. Thank you, Becky. That's really helpful. Ben first. Um, I, I suppose it was in response to your um, question, Elaine, about sort of the next sort of theme, and and one one of the things that I, I feel is quite important is there's a lot there's a lot to cover, there's a lot to be done. But we need, as I say, we need to be mindful about what we can do, what we need to do now. And the other things that we also need to do, but, you know, need to happen over a longer term. So I suppose one theme for me would be what are the phases to that plan? What are we going to plant in the next five years? What are we going to put into an improvement program so it's ready to plant in 20 years time? You know, what skills do we need to develop over a five, 10 year window I don't think it's it's realistic just to say we need to do all these things. We're going to do them all tomorrow, but some things definitely need to happen tomorrow, and some things need to happen but can only happen in five, ten years. So I'd, that's quite an important one for me is is that planning and that phasing of of activities. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I was just going to make a comment on involving the farming unions in future. Uh, you know, get get the policy people along. To, to talk about what their priorities are, uh, because you're never going to bridge the, the gap between what you want to plant and what you can plant unless you've got some active engagement from them. And, and now is an opportunity before, you know, while the sustainable farming scheme is sort of in limbo to, to engage properly with them and, and have better, better communication before the next round. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah, just, just simply to take up Ewan's point, uh, we could have a whole day on how to improve our forestry public relations in all sorts of subjects through the day um, and come to a positive conclusion, and it, including people like farmers, school teachers, and whatever else, um, so that you know we, we raise awareness of what we're doing and you know, talk more about Sitka Spruce, this amazing tree. Yeah, but we can't. We, we've talked. We've talked about it endlessly. Yeah. And um, so, hello. You ask the question. The topic. There is a topic. It's on. It doesn't really sound like it's on, is it? Um, I think everyone has uh, actually just said everything I was going to say, but I just maybe I'll just echo it or summarise it. Um, yeah, I think just uh, what I've noticed from nearly every presentation is like a bottleneck is um, just the skills, the actual people on the ground and getting people into the industry. So just to echo that, um, I'm just a small scale forest forester. I'm not actually sure why I got the email about this, but um, I'd love to see. I, I wish I'd forward it 
forwarded it on to more people I know that work in the industry. I'm not actually sure of the demographic in this room because I've not met everyone. Um, but yeah, it would be really great to continue this conversation with um, a more diverse demographic of people in forestry. Um, and I can't remember what the other thing was. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate thanks for arranging today. It's been a really interesting session. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, found it very interesting. Um, in terms of next steps, I, I think the challenge that is ahead of all of us in this room is enormous in terms of the scale of, that we're talking about. Um, and we talk about 30,000 hectares across the UK uh, on an annual basis. The cost of that is going to be significant. And we cannot continue to look at just government supporting that or public money supporting that. And what I would like to see and what I've really enjoyed today is that engagement between the public and private sector. And in the future, we need to work out how the public and private sector work together. There seems to be a certain feeling of either or, or again, them and us or, or whatever it might be. And, and I hope this is the start of that journey of interacting between the public and private sector because Private sector money isn't always bad. It can be long term. It can be patient. It can be helpful, especially out of areas like pension sectors. We've got to work out how we encourage that into the sector in a positive and supportive manner, because to deliver the challenges that we're aiming for, we're talking billions and billions of pounds, not uh, not not insignificant numbers. So we've got to work out how we interact, and and this is the start of that journey. But if I were being asked, what can we do more of next? It would be bringing public and private sector together more. So thank you. Sorry, it's Ollie Hughes from Gresham House. We're not sure how often they're going to be held, but we will. Yeah. On it. Our intention is to keep going with these. We've got some budget to put behind it. We want to do it in partnership. Um, with everybody and take on board what's been said. Also plug for Anne, who is working ceaselessly on creating a sector skills strategy to go along with the timber industrial strategy. So many of the skills related points that you've raised, that's what Anne is working on and anything you want to feed in about skills, Anne and I are there to listen to that, to build it into the timber industrial strategy we're trying to draft. Um, as to how frequent, I was told off rightly for not giving enough notice of this event um, and so we need to make sure we do give enough notice to get the right mix of people and the right um, you know to publicize it properly and get uh, get it organized so I think I had a couple of months of going like this but possibly we need to you know not run but get them sequenced through the year but this, the intention is certainly there. John. Um. Well, just picking up the point you've just made about um, the skills strategy, which I'm delighted to hear about. So I'd certainly welcome that being a major theme when the time is right uh, with it, that development for a future meeting. Um, because I think quite a few of the speakers have really emphasised the skills deficit and perhaps it could have been emphasised even more strongly in terms of the, uh, the age profile of, a, of the forestry and profession workforce and so on. Clearly, some of the larger companies, Till Hill and so on, have invested heavily in this in your graduate program and so on more of a challenge for the smaller organizations both public sec uh, both um, private and NGOs and so on but I think collectively there will be a need to invest more heavily in this and I, I would suggest Elaine there is a role for CONFOR there as a coordinating body um, while of course forestry organizations are competing for staff uh, I think the there will be sufficient gains in collaborating mutually, uh, and I'm surprised it's not happening more yet. And I particularly flag up um, that some of the current opportunities that are available. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much the apprenticeship scheme in England will be an influence on what you're proposing in your skills strategy, but also um, just to plug the host institution, if that's what we are for a moment. I mean, there is distance learning education for graduates at master's level, which people can um, take part time uh, before they've changed into the forestry sector to propel them into it with a qualification. Or equally, if forestry organisations are willing to recruit people with a lot of 
ability and skills, but not much forestry knowledge, then as a form of CPD, then registering for a part-time master's, for instance, once they've started work, would also be a, uh, an efficient way to upskill. So although it's happening informally, I don't think it's happening strategically enough for the mobilisation of these various mechanisms. James. Yep, James. Hi, everybody. It's James Wormsley from Bank University. Um, John's stolen a bit of my thunder, but um, that's fine. So, yeah, it was just to say, Becky, very, very much appreciate your point about the RFS. And it's fantastic to get, hear you're getting all those inquiries regularly. Do please bear in mind that there is a part time option in uh, postgraduate level in Bangor. I did, in fact, just yesterday speak to someone who was regretting doing a fine art degree uh, 10 years ago but has found her way back into forestry and I'm very much hoping that she's going to join the course. If she does, I've got, I'd put a lot of money on her making a really successful career out of it. Um, it's also to thank the RFS as well. You're putting on the Patsy Wood scholarships and, and the green, the green routes. Um, that's a really great opportunity for lots of our young graduates to, um, to gain experience. Um, I just wanted to say yeah, once again, thanks for, thanks to the organizers for putting this on. Okay. You can always think, okay, we're the, Good to give people more notice, but I think you can just look around the room and you can. And the fact we've got so many people online joining as well is, is testimony to how much interest there is in this topic. And to pick up what Gary was talking about, I mean, lots of the things we're we're seeking, we're striving to change, are about a wood culture, and putting on just simply putting on these events, giving these opportunity for these sort of conservation, these conversations, is part of changing the wood culture, and we really need that. So. I'm backing you all the way with really whatever events you put on that bring people together in this for, in the forestry profession and, and beyond. Um, I just like to make uh, an open invitation. If you do want to think about the skills issue, um, just bear in mind, we have got um, well over a hundred uh, full-time students studying in Bangor on the related degrees. I'm sure a lot of them would love to come and network with many of you today. So. Um, give us a heads up in the future and maybe we can find opportunities to synchronize the events with university timetables. I'm sure I say the same for Jeff at Glyn Cleavon um, and, and other um, HE and FE colleges when I say that. Um, we have successfully done that in the past. Likewise, I'm delighted to see uh, David Jones here. He hasn't graduated yet, but uh, he is here today. I think he's our only, only student attending today. And uh, we well, has got a Teal Hill badge on already, so congratulations to Dav. Um, in terms of what topics to cover, so uh, in, just speaking on, in terms of my experience of engaging with the graduates of, uh, of the Foresters of the Future, so there's a huge appetite amongst the student body for uh, further examples, case studies of resilient woodlands, productive broadleaf woodlands, continuous cover or alternative civil cultural systems, there's a real appetite, a real thirst for that sort of um, information, experience, engagement. So that's just a kind of a suggestion about future topics um, and just picking up um, what Robert Matthews was saying as, as well, again, about mixtures, more complex forest types. Um, UKFS, the trajectory of our forests is they are gonna be more complicated. We know that they're gonna be more diverse, age structurally and species species and age structures. So conversations, information, examples about where people are making success of those, I think could be uh, really interesting as well. Right, I've spoken for far too long. Um, so time for someone else to have the mic. I've got the mic. Okay. Um, we've got a question online, but just before we go to that, I just wanted to say, Becky was speaking before from RFS and um, Becky, I don't think you mentioned the Careers Roadshow that you've um, put on t twice now, uh, March this year, March last year at Glyndeflevon College. Um, and so I I know that there's a lot of hard work goes into that from, from both yourself and, and Jeff and others. And I know this year I attended and Till Hill were there and Moomak were there and Bangor University were there. And we had students from um, ac across North Wales, including... Um, oh, sorry, Cronospan also were there who, who um, encouraged a minibus from Wrexham um, High School to go. And I know it's been really successful and, you know, you've had a lot of interest from that. So um, I just wanted to, to, to point that out, really, how, you know, collectively we are, you know, there's work that the, um, you know, the sector are, are doing and uh, it's showing, showing results. So 
just want to say yeah that. thank you i'll do a quick plug then if anyone else wants to come to that next year we could have really done with a few more exhibitors um so anyone else who could help us out we'd be super grateful um it's an entirely free event the rfs isn't profiting from it it's not about us it's just about us bringing people together um so that young people can learn about forestry and they've been yeah we've already kind of provisionally agreed with jeff that we'll do it again march next year so if you want to reach out to us um and say you'd love to come along and have a free stand we'd be hugely grateful thank you Okay, cool. So that there's 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 a couple of uh, I mean I know that that Gail said just one more question. So sorry to those online who've have just posted a couple more, but I'm just going to ask um is will these events cover the programs under the CIS? That's a science innovation strategy. Thank you very much. So um, today's event was motivated by um, programme two for markets for forest products and services of the science and innovation strategy. But we wanted to obviously um, have forest research come, but also have other speakers. Um, so we hope to run others loosely around the other programmes under the science and innovation strategy. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone for coming, um, to Forest Research and to all of our other presenters. Thank you very much to our delegates who came online. I think there were 49 online, which is great. And the delegates in the room, <clears throat> the presentations and the films of the presenters will be put onto the website. So if students and other people have been unable to come today, one can watch back uh, what's been happening today. Um, also, um, Thank you to Beth Ann, our underused simultaneous translator, and apologies that you weren't better occupied. Um, thank you to Bangor University for hosting the event and to the Wales Rural Network, John and Arwell, who have worked tirelessly to support us in this event. I think it really shows the need for the Wales Rural Network and the support that you can give us in running this sort of event. Um, also to Anne, who has really gone over and above to try and support me uh, to say stay sane and support the event. Um, and so thank you very much. Um, we're just over our closing time now. So um, thank you very much. And we'll get on with organising another one. Thanks. <laughs>